When, when I say the technology be used to fight coronavirus, we should take the technology, you know, as a, a force for good. During the pandemic, we all rely on the broadband. We have to work from home, and children have to study online, and also our social. The intelligent world has arrived. Huawei Enterprise Business Group adheres to the platform plus ecosystem strategy and is working with partners to provide ubiquitous connectivity and intelligence for government and enterprise customers. The digital platform aims to support customers' digital transformation and to bring digital to every organization. Reputable companies around the world are choosing Huawei as their partner in digital transformation. Enterprise business is becoming the main engine of Huawei's growth. Huawei focuses on ICT infrastructure to build ubiquitous connectivity. They promote the implementation of intent-driven networks in various enterprise scenarios and the extensive application of wireless private networks. Huawei uses AI to build pervasive intelligence and team up with customers and partners for joint IT innovation. Huawei's integrated communications technology is accelerating enterprise office digitization. In the enterprise IoT market, Huawei enables industrial digital transformation through ubiquitous connectivity, cloud services, and AI. Huawei has been exploring and implementing the most effective practices of digital transformation with leading enterprises and governments around the world, accelerating financial institutions' transformation. Innovating in the energy field.
Fencing, Transportation, Digitization. Huawei, strive to innovate together with partners throughout a variety of different industries. Open Labs have become an ideal place for industry players to explore and develop unique solutions. And regarding ICT services, Huawei has become a first choice for many. In the future, the Enterprise BG will continue to accelerate industrial digital transformation, focus on creating customer value, and build a digital platform to achieve data convergence. The platform will become a key tool to help industry enterprises carry out digital transformation and become the foundation for us to lead the world into a digital future. The power of intelligence is beyond imagination when technology is applied to education, when thinking connects the world, traditional concepts are reshaped with innovation reinvented. Today's teaching methods are very different. Students are no longer limited to physical classrooms. Anywhere with a network connection can be a classroom. Across regions and countries, professors and students are exchanging ideas and sharing academic achievements. Traveling 195 million years back in time to the Jurassic period, students undertake an exhilarating journey. ICT is providing a vast ocean of knowledge for students, channeling and stimulating their creativity. Let's use curiosity as our compass as we navigate the road to the future, embracing a fully connected, intelligent world. Furthermore, smart sensing is deployed throughout schools helping educators to better understand and guide students. Personalized education allows students to learn according to their interests, maximizing their talent and potential. AI-aided self-service O&M improves administrative management and teaching efficiency, making campus life more convenient. Ubiquitous connectivity, resource sharing anytime and anywhere, and refined campus management are orienting education toward the future. By promoting the digital transformation of education, Huawei is committed to building a fully connected, intelligent world. Together, let's use ICT to stimulate educational innovation and harness the power of intelligence. Dear guests, Welcome to join us here at Huawei CE Nordic Education Webinar 2020. As the world continues to experience the impact of COVID-19, the global education of 1.5 billion students has been disrupted. As we know, the challenges one region is experiencing are that other parts of the world have been going through. That's why it is very crucial that we unite as one collective task force to share the knowledge to combat this impact of COVID together. Today's webinar is with the theme of embracing new era of intelligent education, the response to impact of COVID-19. We are very honored to have three speakers today. Dr. Milosław Moszczyski, a Polish professor from West Pomeranian University of Technology, Poland. He will share with us his personal experience of teaching in university during the pandemic lockdown. Next, we have Dr. Tao Zhan, the director of UNESCO Institutes of Information Technologies for Education. He will share with us how he sees this COVID-19 is reshaping the education today and tomorrow. At last, Huawei Chief Digital Transformation Officer of Enterprise Business Group, Edwin Dinder, he will talk to us that how ICT technologies could serve during this special time. First of all, let's welcome Dr. Milosław. 
I would like to share with you information about the ways of teaching at the university. In Poland, like in many other countries, we use distance learning. Our university has already switched to this system of teaching in March. We conducted classes according to the current schedule just in March. As a technical university, we had no major problems with the transition to distance learning. All employees mastered the appropriate tools quite quickly. Uh, and at the university, we use Microsoft Teams software. It's not a best, the best software on the market, but it can be very, very helpful for us. Uh, we send the materials for classes using this system or an internal platform called eDean. Uh, for exercise and test, we use Microsoft Teams or the Moodle platform. Uh, <clears throat> students must uh, join to organize online meetings and uh, the biggest problem was and still is to conduct classes that require physical access to specialized equipment, uh, specialized hardware. Uh, simulation software cannot completely replace hardware. Until the end of May, students could not use the laboratories. In June, students could finally start using the equipment in the laboratory rooms. Uh, due to the pandemic, the academic year did not end in June, but was extended to the end of July. Now, I would like to say a few words about uh, the students finishing their studies. Their situation was uh, also unusual. Uh, some students graduated in February and some of them did not pass the final exam before March 12. Uh, these people passed uh, their final exam in June. Uh, the new academic year began as, al as always on October 1st. Uh, from the very beginning, only first year students had classes in the university building. Second, third and fourth year students had distance learning from the beginning. Unfortunately, classes for first year students were only conducted normally for the first two weeks. After that time, even they switched to distance learning. Now we know that the distance learning will certainly continue until the end of this year. Uh, today, a student can enter the building and use the equipment in the laboratory room, but only if he or she agrees in advance the day and time with the teacher. <clears throat> Final exam for graduating students are normally held at the university. Now, maybe I say a few words about uh, disadvantages of distance learning. Uh, in my opinion, the biggest disadvantages of distance learning is the lack of meetings between students and teacher on campus. I really miss direct meetings with students. When I was giving lecture in the lecture hall, I could uh, ask questions directly to specific student. 
I was able to talk to the students. I was able to discuss with them. If I teach online, it is more, much more difficult. Students usually have their microphones muted and cameras turned off. In such a situation, even if I ask them about something, I usually only hear silence has already switched to the system of teaching in March. We conducted classes according to the current schedule, just in March. As a technical university, we had no major problems with the transition to distance learning. All employees mastered the appropriate tools quite quickly uh, and at the university, we use Microsoft Teams software. It's not a best, the best software on the market, but it can be very, very helpful for us. Uh, we send the materials for classes using this system or an internal platform called eDean. Uh, for exercise and test, we use Microsoft Teams or the Moodle platform. Uh, <clears throat> students must uh, join to organize online meetings. And uh, the biggest problem was and still is to conduct classes that require physical access to specialized equipment, uh, specialized hardware. Uh, simulation software cannot completely replace hardware. Until the end of May, students could not use the laboratories. In June, students could finally start using the equipment in the laboratory rooms. Uh, due to the pandemic, the academic year did not end in June, but was extended to the end of July. Now, I would like to say a few words about uh, the students finishing their studies. Their situation was uh, also unusual. Uh, some students graduated in February and some of them did not pass the final exam before March 12. Uh, these people passed uh, their final exam in June. Uh, the new academic year began as, al as always on October 1st. Uh, from the very beginning, only first year students had classes in the university building. Second, third and fourth year students had distance learning from the beginning. Unfortunately, classes for first year students were only conducted normally for the first two weeks. After that time, even they switched to distance learning. Now we know that the distance learning will certainly continue until the end of this year. Uh, today, a student can enter the building and use the equipment in the laboratory room, but only if he or she agrees in advance the day and time with the teacher. <clears throat> Final exam for graduating students are normally held at the university. Now maybe I say a few words about uh, disadvantages of distance learning. Uh, in my opinion, the biggest disadvantages of distance learning is the lack of meetings between students and teacher on campus. 
I really miss direct meetings with students. When I was giving lecture in the lecture hall, I could ask questions directly to specific student. I was able to talk to the students. I was able to discuss with them. If I teach online, it is more, much more difficult. Students usually have their microphones muted and cameras turned off. In such a situation, even if I ask them about something, I usually only hear silence. I teach computer programming and from information obtained from students, I know that it is also more difficult for them, especially for them. Uh, distance learning <clears throat> is very difficult for all first year students. When I meet with students in a laboratory room, I can see how they are dealing with a given task. I can advise something when classes take place in the laboratory room, while the student is writing the program, I could immediately tell him what is good or bad in the program. In distance learning, this form of, of interaction between me and my students is uh, practically impossible. People with only desktop computers often do not have a camera. This is a big problem. Some students have a lot low in, uh, speed internet connection. Uh, in such a situation, I often cannot talk to the student. It is very difficult for such students to gain new knowledge. Even if he has a problem so with solving the task, I cannot talk to him because he has a slow internet connection. Uh, we can only exchange messages. Unfortunately, uh, not every problem can be easily described in a clear way. Such a communication process takes a lot of time. It's very slowly. Another big problem is also the performance of uh, servers used for online activities. It happens that students can hardly hear what the lecturer is talking about. Sometimes they hear only fragments of what the lecturer says. From my own experience, I know that sometimes students see what I show with a delay. <clears throat> now I would like to talk about tasks, tests and checking the students' knowledge. It is a big problem too. The biggest problem with many subjects is verification of students' knowledge. Uh, with the help of appropriate software tools, such as a Moodle platform, you can carry out tests. Uh, but tests not always a guarantee uh, that the student has mastered the knowledge well. You can ask students to do their homework, but not all students are honest. Uh, some of them exchange uh, homework solution between themselves. If I receive uh, 100 or more electronic documents, I cannot eliminate, eliminate all uh, plagiarism. It is not possible to check the student's knowledge by, by talking to them because some have a slow internet connection. I must admit that uh, I do not find a good solution to uh, verify a student's skills. Testing the student's knowledge and skills in today's reality is very difficult. I hope uh, that the distance learning will soon uh, be over will be over and I will be able to meet the students in the lecture and laboratory room. 
I wish you all health and a Thank you, Mr. Miloswa, for taking the time to share with us your personal ex experience and personal opinions. Um, now, moving on, let's take a look at the further global approach. Um, Dr. Tao Zhang, how he sees this COVID is impacting the education industry. Hello, colleagues and friends. Greetings from Moscow. Representing UNESCO Institute, for Information Technologies in Education, IITE, I am very pleased to participate as a close collaboration partner with Huawei. As we are all aware that the COVID-19 pandemic is receiving teaching and learning everywhere in the world. It has brought huge changes and unprecedented, unprecedented challenges to our education system because we had never experienced such challenges before. How to better support teachers, students, parents, and policymakers? How to better support countries in need, in particular developing countries like in Africa, and how to better support people with special needs? These are challenges we are facing. It is clear there is no easy and simple solution to it. It is also clear, however, that the only way for us to move forward is through working together with our collective strengths and with the power of technology, in particular with the, the, with the power of advanced digital technology. I think the global today is also a good, good example of this collective approach. UNESCO as the United Nations organization with its mandate on education has been taking immediate actions and emergency response since the very beginning of the pandemic. Among its all actions taken, there is a very important one. It is called Global Education Coalition, which attracts over 130 partners from all over the world. It aims at mobilizing partnership and resources from the, all, from the globe in order to support countries in need, to support people in need. This global coalition has three flagship initiatives from which you can have a, have a picture of UNESCO's priority and the challenge the major challenges we are facing the first flagship initiative is on connectivity including infrastructure and internet accessibility including free and open platforms and tools to support teaching and learning including free and open online resources and including data which are very crucial for decision making, for monitoring, and for individualized teaching and learning as well. The second initiative is on teachers. As we all know, teachers, they are at the very front line during the pandemic. They have huge responsibilities. And meanwhile, they are the group who need the most support from us. So UNESCO has been mobilized different resources to support teacher training so that they can uh, better shift to online and distance teaching and learning. Huawei's Learn On project or ICT Academy, which is a free online resources and courses, is a good example of, such, uh, of, of this initiative. And the UNESCO IITE, uh, as a partner working together with UNESCO Institute ICBA in Africa and the UNESCO International Center enrolled in Beijing, we have designed and developed a free online course, especially for teachers in Africa. So they are examples of how to support teachers in Africa and in other countries during the pandemic. And the third flagship is on gender 
is on girls' education and uh, to support other vulnerable groups. As we know that the vulnerable groups, they are even facing more difficult situation during the pandemic to keep their teaching going on. So they need special support from the global international uh, community. In addition to these three flagships, I'd like to mention UNESCO's Africa priority. And during the pandemic, it is also a priority of UNESCO's collective approach. Among the collective actions to support Africa, Huawei has been very actively participate in Huawei's online resources and Huawei's support are very popular in many countries in Africa. The pandemic is not yet over. The situation is still very challenging and difficult. But many of us are looking at the future. Many of us are asking what are the lessons learned from this pandemic for education? Everyone may have different answers. However, one point is clear. That is, the world is not prepared for the pandemic. Our education system is not prepared, not just in developing countries in Africa, but also in Europe, in America, in countries like China and Russia, not just in remote areas, but also in big cities like in Shenzhen or in Moscow, not just at the school level, but also at the universities who are leading education innovation, who are leading online education. If we talk about vulnerable groups, the situation is even more challenging. So we are, not we are not prepared for the pandemic. Therefore, it is a very challenging, very important task for all governments, for all of us, to build a resilient education system for future. If there is another pandemic, of course, we all expect there will be no one happening in the future. However, if there is one, we could be better prepared so that learning and teaching could be going on for everyone. It's a huge task. And what will be the so-called resilient education system and how to build such a resilient education system? I think there is something cannot be missing there. That is, this resilient education system must be based on digital technology, must be based on online education. So education will go digital. This is even bigger lesson learned for all of us from the pandemic. As someone working in the area of education and technology, I understand the importance of digital education. I firmly believe, even before pandemic, that future education will be digital education. I also understand the challenge. I understand how difficult it is to promote, to accelerate this process, even at the universities, even in big cities where the infrastructure and the internet connectivity is ready for almost everyone. However, I never expected that this process has been accelerated so dramatically by this pandemic. This pandemic tells us that going digital for education is possible. Education will go digital. Though today we still cannot miss the low tech, even no tech, to support countries and people in need. Going digital is not an option for us. Going digital is a must. It's the only way forward for the future of our education. I think this is the most important lesson learned for us from this pandemic. Education will enter a new era 
of innovation. We need to be better prepared for that. We need to have a better and a clear understanding of this new era in the near future. Yes, today we often talk about how we can better use technology to support teaching and learning. We talk about how the advanced digital technology like artificial intelligence, big data, or 5G technologies would be reshaping the way of teaching and learning and even changing our education system. We talk about how to keep education as human-centered to avoid any possible negative impact. We use the phrases like technology enabled teaching and learning or integration or infusion of technology with education. They are all fine. However, I think it is not yet enough. I believe that the new era of education innovation will be an era when education and technology are interacting with each other. Education and technology are inspiring with each other. When education sector and technology sector are working and partnering with each other as one united team. This new era will offer huge opportunities for innovation and partnership. And Huawei, I think, could play even better and more important role in this new era as a global leading tech giant in this area. At the moment, my institute, IITE, is now working with a number of other partners on a new project. This new project is focusing on the rethinking and the redesigning of smart learning and the smart education strategy at the national level. The top issues include issues like uh, the new relationship between education and technology, how to redesign smart learning at school level and the smart education system at the national level, and how to ensure inclusion when we use, when we talking about education and technology interaction. As we all know that whenever we talk about a new technology, on one hand, we are inspired by, we are fascinated by the new technology. On the other hand, we are afraid of new divide, new digital divide when new technologies come. So it's a very challenging issue. Even though there are so many challenges, we are very optimistic for future. If we look at the human history, every time there is after a crisis, there will be new boomings. And this time, I think the new economic booming will be digital economy. And the new education booming will be part of it. Part of the new booming will be the digital so therefore, I'm looking forward to work more closely with Huawei and other partners for the other part of the world as well for our shared mission and dream, that is to offer better education and a better future, better world for everyone. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you to Dr. Zhang for sharing with us this going digital approach. I wonder how Huawei Chief Digital Transformation Officer has to say on this. Mr. Edwin is a cross-industry expert. He has 26 years of experience in public and private sector. He has been a guest lecturer himself in many educational institutes like the Amsterdam University of Applied Sciences, the Russian Presidential Academy of National Economics and Public Administration and Huawei University, so for sure he is an industry insider. Let's hear what he brings to us. COVID has hit the world by surprise, and as a result, in the business environment, more and more people, more and more, 
members, more and more employees, are forced to work from home. In education, it is exactly the same. Schools close, lessons are suspended. Students and teachers have to learn and teach from home. I'd like to present to you some effective solutions in how to respond to this scenario. And of course, at some point, when students and teachers are able to return safe back to school, I'd like to tell you a bit about how we have solutions that support that as well. My name is Edwin Deander and I'm Chief Digital Transformation Officer in our Global Government Industry Department. And I'd like to talk you through some global footprints of solutions that we've rolled out worldwide. I've got some examples of solutions in this particular topic, but let's share with you and agree with you on a few challenges and trends. I'm sure you agree with me that COVID-19 is profoundly impacting global, social and economic operations. The number of cases worldwide across the number of countries and unfortunately the number of deaths are staggering, really staggering. And it's putting a burden not only on healthcare environments and on society as a whole, but particularly also on the educational environment. Because not every kid at home has the ability to log on to an online teaching environment and learn from home. Not every teacher either. School closure, closures are affected for 87.6% in enrolled learnings. This is a information slide from the UNESCO. Also, these numbers are staggering. It means that when school closes and lessons are suspended and students and teachers are forced to learn and teach from home, sometimes it really means that there is no learning and no teaching at all because either the home infrastructure doesn't scale or the neighborhood IT environment doesn't add up or connectivity is just not there. There are some response measures that we took and that we take very seriously. We really see and we really need to ensure that students are able to teach and learn anywhere and that teachers are able to provide that. Of course, we need to bring systems and services in place that helps flatten the curve. For example, when students and teachers return back to school, we still need to make sure that prevention and countermeasures are in place to make sure that any virus doesn't spread. And that brings us to returning to school safely. These are response measures that we really need to take very, very seriously. And we did, and we do. So let me give you a few examples on how and where we do that. ICT education solutions as a response to the COVID-19 outbreak in environments. For example, providing online digital learning environments, cloud-based online learning. Sit where you like, use the device of your choice, teaching and learning anytime, anywhere. And by doing so, you're logging on to a virtual classroom, to a online live solution, a live classroom. Maybe this is a digital version of the physical classroom environment. So in the burst period where the outbreak sits at phase one and where there are so many cases going out that school is suspended, lessons are suspended, school closed, lessons are suspended, and students are forced to go somewhere else. This would be an example of how to create connectivity and how to bring services. And then in the phase two, when we safely are able to return back to school, putting measures in place to allow that to be, take place in a safe and secure manner. Public and private cloud provides a global connectivity and a global service enablement. Here is an information slide that shows you a bit of, of how we already have rolled that out worldwide. There is a huge and a tremendous possibility for the moment there is connectivity, and this could be either at home, this could be in a residential area, this could be in a community services center, this could be one family member moving to the family member's house or another family member's house. It could be anywhere, anytime. As long as we're able to provide connectivity from a cloud-based environment, classroom, schooling, teaching and learning is following a student, is following the principle of student-centric learning. A cloud-based solution also provides innovative and engaging and personalized online learning experience. Not every student is the same. Mobile devices, digital devices, tablets and computers already have a huge and a tremendous amount of opportunity and possibility to modify and optimize its viewing 
and its presentation services towards the user. So if child number one has a certain eye uh, disorder, so to speak, then the screen can be optimized in such a way that it still best fits this particular child. Another example would be where a child perhaps would be blind or where a child is deaf. Still, and even then, and particularly then, via cloud-based and online and AI-enabled services provisioning, we're able to provide and optimize curriculum in such a way that, for example, a, a, a deaf student has an avatar in the corner of the screen that speaks sign language as the presentation in the screen is perhaps text only. With optical character recognition services, for example, in such an environment, we're able to read text of a textbook that perhaps a teacher has in his hand and holds in front of a camera for everyone else to read. A deaf child, of course, could also read that. But a deaf child can also read it via an avatar in the corner of the screen that speaks it in sign language. For a blind person, that, of course, would be the same. There is automated text to speech and speech to text mechanisms that can read text and speak out loud to incre increase the user and student-centric learning experience from a learning platform. Interactive classes that works towards student for course learning, discussions and online testing. It works towards the principal and the staff and administrators and it also works towards teachers and professors in an integrated and in an intuitive environment. Home teaching and home learning is where such an infrastructure and such a capability are adding to the need of home learning and home teaching. So creating a home environment as if the child is at school. Creating a digital environment at home or anywhere as if the child is at school. And there's different classroom services. Uh, recording and video on demand. So a teacher can record lessons and curriculum now, can upload it to this platform, and then for students and, 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 and kids at home, for example, is, are able to retrieve it and uh, get their head around this curriculum at any given moment in time that suits their daily uh, rhythm, for example, best. Uh, the same goes for registration and check-in for students sign in and sign out. When is a student at class and when is a student not at class? In real time, interactive class participation also exists if students are not in the same class at the same time. They are digitally and remotely in the same class. So if they stand up, for example, or if they raise their hand, if they want to have a question, even when they're at home, this is visible in a digital and an online environment. And a teacher and a professor can see this in their screen, gets notifications of it, and can actually turn to the child at home and let them speak, let them ask their question and have an interactive session. And then for the safe return back to school, we see entrances and exits where countermeasures needs to be put in place to make sure that we're able to enter and exit in a safe and sound environment. There are services available to support uh, protection and safety and security on playgrounds. The same goes for the surrounding area and perimeters. And of course, there is elements, maybe even in the kitchen uh, or the canteen or the school cafeteria. Because of COVID, we have to be extra, extra aware of our behavior, of the things we do and how we do it. Uh, things like clean, healthy, hygienic, washing hands and so on and so forth. Maybe even face masks and what have you. So many different measures and countermeasures already are in place. And a digital environment allows us to provide prevention and control of the epidemic and to allow students and teachers to return safely back to school. An on-premise live virtual classroom also does that. Even when we were returning to school, for example, in the old days, so to speak, so before the pandemic, perhaps we had 10 teachers in 10 different classrooms and students move across the hallway. From 9 to 10, I got lesson number one in room number one. From 10 to 11, I got class number two in room number two. And that goes for all the students throughout the university or educational campus. But with this pandemic going around, even if we're returned to school, perhaps these crowdly movements might not be the wisest thing to do. So if we're allowing our students and our teachers to teach from home and to learn from home in a digital and online environment, and when we then return back to the campus and when we return back to school, perhaps this similar principle can be put in place. So your class number two from the teacher in class number two is brought to you in class number one remotely or we're letting the teachers 
move around the hallway with the right social distance and the students stay in their class. And wherever other classes are taking place, wherever specific particular parts in their assignments, for example, are coming in, we can use the digital and online distribution and information sharing environment to facilitate that. HD stands for high definition, high definition distant learning, high definition audio, video and multimedia sharing. A live virtual classroom LVC teaching platform facilitates these services and allows applications on tablets, laptops, um, smartphones, but even screens anywhere, anytime to be able to present all these and to promote uh, virtual teaching. And that brings me to the last part of my session, our global footprint in this. This is not a one-off. This is not uniquely, and this is not necessarily designed to fight the pandemic. This already is available for a long time and up and running. The future for education is now. Not a new solution for the world of tomorrow, but a solution based on the ideas of tomorrow, implemented already today. USST in Shanghai is one of the largest universities for science and technology, and they precisely and specifically needed uh, so many information services when students and professors came back to the university campus that they've created a digital environment for health check and health punch in. It's an app that is distributed throughout the university campus and all the devices that students and teachers are using. And what they do is they open it, they check in that they're available at school and they answer questions like temperature, uh, breathing uh, problems and so on and so forth. And they upload that to a system for analysis and assure and secure uh, and safe return back to school and tracing of um, uh, social records and so on and so forth. Campus services and applications are provided by an integrated software vendor and other third parties are creating a digital environment to really enforce and enable the re safely return back to school. UMJ in Indonesia has done similar and wider um, digital where possible online where needed, physical in class also, but digitally supported by different application and different services, running on and built on a foundation for smart education that supports physical and digital, online and offline teaching and learning in a safe and a sound environment to safely return back to school and to keep the pandemic out and flatten the curve. This is what I had to share with you. Our smart education global footprint is everywhere and anywhere. As I said before, it's not a one-off, it's not a one-go, it's not a project, it's a principle, it's a team that already works in this industry for a long time and we're supporting in different environments, the educational research networks, institutions, uh, universities, primary and secondary schools and what have you throughout the world and we look forward to support you as well. And that brings me to the end of my session. Before closing it up and thanking you for your attention, I will summarize a bit on how we support home teaching and remote learning when schools are suspended and classes are done remotely and how we are able to go back to school in a safe manner. We spoke about how to ensure and the importance of ensuring student teaching and learning during the pandemic when school is closed and classes are suspended. We've talked about how to help flatten the curve when students go back to school and how technology supports to return to school safely. A few items that we've addressed are in the slide next to me. A live virtual classroom that supports online teaching and remote learning. And when we're returning to school, this same platform supports the ability for students to stay in class and the rest of the class members also stay in class. So instead of traveling through the hallway, a live virtual classroom while with other students in the same classroom supports uh, a re safe return back to school. And we spoke a bit about how ICT can support different countermeasures to make sure that a safe entrance and a safe exit and a safe movement of students and teachers across the university and school campus can be done in a safe and controlled manner to help flatten the curve. A real-time personalized learning experience throughout the journey of learning and education. A live virtual classroom that supports students, principals, teachers, and administrators throughout this digital journey. And last but not least, I've introduced that this is a common business practice for Huawei. The future is now. Cases I've presented are live and up and running already for a few years. A smart education global footprint 
is already existing for a long, long time to help a better education environment for our children as we go forward. Thank you very much. Adwin is with us right now, so we can um, answer the questions one by one, shall we? So let's check the first uh, question. Adwin, can you, uh, we cannot hear you. Well, sorry. We cannot hear you. We, we still cannot hear you, or it's just me or you. Uh oh, we're experiencing slow internet or something wrong with the internet. So is this pandemic affected the ethical education of the students? This question from Mohammed. Oh, we lost you again. Well, that's the dis disadvantage of the 21st century, yes. We have long distance. So here I am in Poland and Edwin is in Shenzhen. So probably real obstacles for the, uh, for the communication through long distance. <laughs> yes, we hear you. I'm so happy to hear you. Oh, okay. Yeah, likewise. So, it, it, so what we discussed in this webinar addresses the exact same issue that we have here. Even though we really is feel the strong need for global and interactive communication, also between teachers and students, it is so depending on quality of networks and on the uh, availability of networks that it really puts a burden also in teaching and education. This is a good example for that. So imagine a child at home needing to figure out how this works, where to click, why is my microphone not working? Mom, mom, can you help me? You know, these ideas, that's not easy. Really not easy. Definitely. Um, Definitely. Let, me, let me see if I can try and answer this question. Is this pandemic <laughs> affected, affecting the ethical education of the students? That's a rather philosophical question. I would say that in every day, in time, whether it's the pandemic or not, there is of course always an element of ethical and ethics. I do think that we perhaps didn't really realize that because we're forcing teachers and students to be at home, that your behavior, for example, or the way you're supposed to behave in class physically is a little different than when you're at home. Um, it should come with guidelines, I guess, that maybe because of the speed of the pandemic that has come in, we haven't really thought that through as an industry. But I also think it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to rethink 
how and what to do with online teaching, online learning, remote teaching and remote learning. Maybe indeed it is required to provide a, a guideline perhaps on how to behave when you're attending class as you are at home versus what it means when you're in class in an actual physical classroom in a physical environment. So I think it's a very good question and we, we, we should think this through. So has it affected? I think affected with an A is more applicable. The pandemic has affected with an A, the ethical education of students. So definitely um, that we have been uh, affected by this, uh, yes, by this. I think, I, I think what the pandemic has done is had, it has made us become more aware that there are, that there are different ethics when it mm -hmm. comes to being physical in class or joining remotely. Uh, mm -hmm. And that has to do with uh, raising hands, standing up, asking questions, talking around. Um, so it, it indeed had and has an effect on, on, on the ethical way of teaching. Mm -hmm. it, okay. In a class, everybody shut. In a class, everybody knows that when a teacher speaks, you're not supposed to uh, raise your voice. But with the electronic environment, it's not always easy to either close your microphone or open it up again. Um, so it, it requires an other format and an other way of thinking, not only for mm -hmm. teachers and for students, but also for tutors, maybe parents at home who now become uh, sort of a coordinator to make sure that the home Wi-Fi works and gives the child a bit of an idea at home how to work with uh, technology, perhaps. Um, so it requires so, so, everybody's yeah. um, reformat as a behavior, yeah? That's what ethics ethics always applies to everybody. So yeah, in this in this case, I would say yes as well. Okay, so we're moving on to the second question. Should digital learning be looking more at new way of learning, like serious games for learning? Use the old classroom model, seeing the wrong approach. Hmm. Yeah, I'm fully I fully agree on that. To be very honest, um, recently. Um, almost at the same time when we were preparing for this webinar uh, in our organization and in my department, we've also been preparing for uh, trainings to our channel partners and our ecosystem. And there I am addressing actually this. I, uh, I asked uh, the audience to imagine the very first telephone from maybe 100 or 110 years ago. And then imagine a telephone from the 1980s, 1990s, maybe when some of us were going to the office after we've graduated from high school or university and then imagine your means of communication today and my conclusion is that it's clear that in more than 100 years this communication device has changed tremendously from form factor from usage and from uh, user ability and user friendliness the second question i asked the audience was to imagine the means of transportation 100 years ago that would probably be some thing that looks like a horse in front of a carriage. And then the second form of transportation would be if that becomes a car. And then this car or this vehicle, if we take a vehicle from the 1950s, from the 1970s, from the early 2000s to today, there is a tremendous amount of change in the form factor, the usability, and, and so on and so forth of, uh, of a car and means of transportation. And then I asked the audience, imagine a thousand years ago, maybe you've seen this on a picture or a painting, a classroom. Now imagine a classroom when our grandparents were going to school. And then imagine a classroom when we as parents were going to school. And now imagine a classroom where our children are going to school today. Clearly, everybody agrees and acknowledges with me that in the past thousands of years, no matter whether it's a painting, a picture, your own memory, or your own visibility when you bring your child to class, there is no change whatsoever in class, in classrooms. And I fully agree with the statement that is here posted by Mr. Stuart Kowalski. I fully agree that in digital transformation, the old way of working just does not match, does not fit. The whole system of education and teaching probably also doesn't fit. We have to rethink the way we are able to bring knowledge, create knowledge, share knowledge, how we educate and how we teach, how student-centric, maybe even person or personal-centric 
information gathering and teaching should be taking place rather than a teacher who has a bit of knowledge stands in front of a class where 25 or 30 or 35 people are looking at him or her and trying to absor absorb whatever comes out of the brain and out of the bright mind and mouth of the teacher. We have to think that the old classroom model is indeed the wrong approach. Digital, by the way, allows us to do that. Digital allows us to recreate and reinvent not only teaching and education, but also the way it's been brought and the way it's been provided and the way it can be absorbed by those who want to be taught and those who are uh, being educated. Um, so it, this is a very good point. This is a very good point. So, so as I understood, you are saying that um, as a situation is changing, as a new technology are being invented, the way of learning, the way of teaching should be evolved as well, like along the change of the technology, uh, change of this environment, yes? Yes. Okay, okay. So we are moving on to the next question. We have another question here. There is a heavy problem of equipment in countries that are not so digitally developed and they can't afford the needed equipment for online learning or smart classroom. Is there any solution to that? Donations or school sponsorship, et cetera? Yes, the answer is yes. The answer is exactly what it says there. It is donations, it is school sponsorship, it is public uh, and private sector partnerships. It is where uh, the commercial market or maybe even the tech market are aligning themselves with um, with the schooling and university and, and, and uh, academic world. Um, so the answer is a full yes. And there are many examples worldwide where this takes place, not just in those countries who are perhaps not so digitally advanced yet. Because I think in there are many examples where donations and school sponsors, sponsorships are also able to accelerate uh, the development of a digital infrastructure for educational services and linking um, maybe areas and maybe even buildings that were not schools from the start are now being able to be converted into a digitally engaged environment where uh, children, for example, can gather like a community services center, for example, and where um, desks are being put in place. And on these desks are screens and keyboards and mouses and what have you. And via digital and cloud enabled services, the online teaching and the online learning environment can be brought to this area, to this location that previously was not a school. It's not designed as a school, it's not built as a school, but today it's being used as a place where teaching and learning takes place. And that can only be done by, um, by digitalization by developing on the digital path as we go forward and where donation, yes, school sponsorship and other forms of partnerships take place. So there are many ways um, to get education or advance the education, yes. So it's just a matter of how we are gonna um, come up with the ideas, how we're gonna do it, find the solutions to clearly. broad our knowledge. Clearly. Yeah, clearly. Okay. And not only Huawei, but many organizations like Huawei in this uh, uh, in this digital tech industry, so to speak, with a strong feeling and a strong association also for the educational environment and for the educational industry, have many examples on how um, we as an organization, but also our colleagues in the same uh, industry domain are supporting uh, those nations, those regions, those areas that perhaps today are digitally disconnected, but that have to be connected in order to provide and benefit from uh, online and digital learning environments. Yes, so we are we have many partners uh, on the same journey with us. So pro, uh, every, every one of us are realize the importance of the education for our country's future. So for sure, on this journey, we're on, on, not alone. Yeah. Very much, okay. yes, very much, yes. It really is an in, it really is an industry effort, and I, I don't want to use the word competition, but also our competitors, for lack of a better word. That's why I'm early earlier. I was saying, similar organizations, similar to Huawei, all and everyone in this industry domain are putting their hands, uh, are standing hand to hand in hand, shoulder by shoulder, to provide a digitally enabled uh, learning and teaching environments for those areas in need that today perhaps are not able to be digitally connected, but have to be connected and we have to put that in place. It's not just a Huawei game or a few technology organizations. It is 
really all and every organization, tech organization in this industry doing that. So everyone is in this. Totally, totally. Oh, yeah. Okay, so we are running out of time. So we have one last question. Uh, let's see. The wider student experience, including engagement in clubs, societies, and extracurricular activities, was always a part of on campus activities. How to connect and socialize at schools and univers universities now? Uh, so. Well, to be very. Yeah, to be very, very honest, I, I think this is a bit of an outdated question because I think the majority of um, social engagement is uh, both online and offline, is both both dis digital and physical already. The amount of uh, 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 digital and social messaging platforms that students are using, for example, to gather uh, outside the dormitory or on the school playground, uh, for for whatever it is that they want to do, for example, uh, sports activities or or other forms of uh, physical social activities, um, the engagement for that and the arrangement for that, as far as we can see, is already highly highly uh, uh, very high up on the digital social platforms. Uh, in China, WeChat groups, for example, in uh, in Taiwan and in uh, Southeast Asia, like uh, like Malaysia, but also in uh, in Thailand or in Singapore, the platform line um, or, or the application line where line groups are being established. So digitally connected and social platforms, um, multimedia social platforms are being used to gather and share information in order to meet, for example, in clubs, go to societies or uh, engage in extracurricular activities. So the world of online, and offline are already blending. And I think it's only going to uplift more uh, as we are unable to meet physically. So I um, I can give examples where, for example, a student party is being organized online where everybody in their dormitory perhaps has a drink and some snacks and where perhaps the school band is performing where the drummer is in his own place, the bass player is in his own room, maybe the guitar player is at home and the bass player and the keyboard player are somewhere else, but together online, they're making music and the rest of the students and their peers and their friends are joining online to um, to, 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 to be part of this. So I don't fully agree with uh, the statement here that the wider student experience, including engagement in clubs and so on, was always part of an on-campus activity. I think yes, before the world of digital and before the world of social media, that was correct. But because the world of digital is already here for a long time, and certainly the world of social media is here already for a long time, I think this already comes together and meets in the middle very nicely. Yes, because uh, in my opinion, connection is kind of human nature. We always seek the solutions to meet, to connect. So no matter what was before on campus activities or right now we're restricted uh, in our own dormitory or home, we always find a way to connect no matter uh, in which platform or in which way. This is our nature. We are always will find a way to connect between each other. Yeah, and it's ongoing. It's of all times. Yeah. It's of all times. Yeah. Earlier, it was sending text messages and SMS when that was coming up. Then it was WhatsApp or what have you, Facebook Messenger. That is ongoing. And I think it's it's it, it meets in the middle very nicely. Yeah, it and it definitely will not stop <laughs> from here. No, it won't. No, it won't. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Edwin. I think that's enough for our Q&A session. Thank you for your time. Thank you for organizing this webinar and uh, we look forward to spread the word even more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Edwin and all the speakers. And thank you to all the guests who are listening and watching. We know the importance of education for a country's future. We do hope that we can join hands together as we advance. Last, let me remind you that there will be a short survey at the end. Please tell us that at least one area that you think ICT technologies could add value to education. That's all for today. Goodbye.
Hey, hello, Bill. Mike's here. We are ready to go. Let's get started. Sorry, Mike. Uh, we still need a couple of minutes to set up. Okay, no problem. Okay, okay. Okay. Uh, hello, Mike. We are all set up. Uh, you should be able to see us, right? Mm, we can see everyone. So anyway, let's get started. There are a lot of tools for meetings, but convenience. There are a lot of tools for meetings. Excuse me. I, I can't hear you. Excuse me. Who is presenting now? This is a product which can solve all these problems. Making the meeting smoother and smarter. This also comes with speaker check-in. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I have to get this. Well, Bill, the results show that the users gave high reputation for our device. Uh, apologize, guys. Can you hear the drilling? The room next to us is renovating. Mm, nope. Okay, let's move on. Amber, let's go to your design proposal. Please give me a sec, let me set up the projector. Thank you, Amber. Okay, Sophie. Now let's take a look at our version. Of course. Guys, I have sent the meeting minutes for everyone. Okay, guys, thank you for attending today's meeting. Any questions? No? Okay, let's end this meeting. Oh, wait, wait. I have a suggestion for you, Bill. You really should try Idea Hub next time. Huawei Idea Hub. New style, smart office. Hey, Mike. Oh, Bill. You guys are early today. We got the Idea Hub. It really feels like we're in the same room. <laughs>